Welcome to Zero. I am Akshat Rathi. Today, Exxon's new tactic. An oil CEO walks into a climate conference. No, it's not a joke. Actually, these days it's not even an uncommon occurrence. But it is still a big deal when that CEO is Darren Woods, who leads ExxonMobil Corporation. Regardless of where this interview happened, I would have jumped on the opportunity. Far too few oil CEOs open themselves up to journalistic scrutiny. That it was at a climate conference in Baku, Azerbaijan, only made it more interesting. And this was not Darren's first rodeo. He became the first Exxon CEO ever to attend a climate conference at COP28 in Dubai last year. When we spoke, it was only days since the US election result had come out. And Darren had things to say about Donald Trump that I wasn't expecting. He also had strong ideas about how Exxon can be a positive force on climate. Now that might seem odd. It is among the world's largest oil companies, and it has increased oil production quite a lot over the last few years. There is also a well-documented history of companies like Exxon sowing doubt about climate science to slow down climate action. But something has clearly changed, and it's worth hearing Darren's take. Welcome, everybody, to a live taping of the Zero Podcast at COP29, and welcome to the show, Darren. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, here we are in Baku, and before I get to important questions, let me ask you, what are you doing for fun while you're in Azerbaijan? (laughs) People keep recommending to me that I should take a bath in crude oil. It's a thing that a famous spa offers over here, and I fact-checked it, and it's real. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I got in last night and uh, I'm spending the day here uh, with talking to a number of people trying to share ExxonMobil's perspective on how we can contribute to this challenge that we're all discussing this week. So let's get to business then. Many people here will see Exxon as a barrier to tackling climate change, mm-hmm. but you're here at a COP, you're here at a COP for the second time, so you clearly don't think so. Why do you come to a COP? Well, I think you know, one of the things that's been happening over the last uh, several years is the challenge of significantly reducing emissions while continuing to meet the growing demand for affordable energy is a tough challenge to solve. I think the policies that have been pursued to date are very narrowly focused on limiting the supply of traditional sources and trying to drive more expensive alternatives that, frankly, isn't accomplishing the overall objective. If you look at where we stand today, oil is at record levels of demand, uh, coal, uh, gasoline, diesel. And so I think while wind and solar and electric vehicles are going to play a very important role, they're necessary, they're not sufficient, we need more solutions. Frankly, as a company, we think we can bring those solutions to bear. If you look at what we're doing today, we have the only large-scale carbon capture and storage system in the world. We've got uh, five customers with almost 7 million tons per annum of contracted storage for CO2. No other company in the world has that. We're developing the world's largest virtually carbon-free hydrogen facility in the U.S. We've got plans to build that if the IRA legislation gets translated into regulation. We're developing a new technique for producing lithium to supply uh, battery markets. We're doing work on carbon and uh, we have an opportunity to build a new type of anode for batteries which have the potential to increase uh, battery capacity by 30%. And so a lot of things we're doing across a very broad spectrum of opportunities, leveraging our core capabilities to try to help reduce the world's emissions. But COP is mainly about countries negotiating over, I will say laborious text, because I've seen some of that text. What conversation do you have as a corporate CEO here at COP that are beneficial to you as a company? Well, I think it's trying to make sure we have a good understanding of where people are, what their concerns are, where they're focused at. You know, there are a lot of ambitions and aspirations that come out of the COP discussions. We're very focused on the action and how do you go from ambition to plan? So we're trying to help provide a perspective from a company in an industry that has a very long history 
of taking ambitious plans or ambitious uh, objectives and translating those into real world plans and ultimately putting steel on the ground and, and building facilities to accomplish them. So we are going to unpack a lot of the solutions you've talked about, but before we dive deeper into that, I think it's worth addressing two elephants in this room, Trump and trust. Let's start with Trump. Mm -hmm. Do you think Donald Trump, he's going to be in his second presidential term in the U.S. in January. Do you think Donald Trump is a threat to global climate action? I think, you know, if you look at the time scale that's going to be required to address this challenge and the way that we think about it is a very it's a long term investment. There's work that has to be done. And so I'm not sure that any one administration is going to significantly advance the pace of the transition or conversely significantly uh, slow the pace. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done across the world, a lot of sectors that need to be advancing the work in this space. Frankly, we need more comprehensive policy, things that encourage and tap into the capabilities of companies and markets to reduce emissions. We're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table today as a global society, as governments around the world. There's a lot of work to be done here. I don't think we're depending on any one administration or any one country, frankly, to advance the, the, the global objectives. So even as uh, the president of the largest economy in the world, the second largest emitter, if it's a four year term, you're not that worried, but you do want to see policies. And we know that Trump pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement the first time around. He has said that he will do so again. You have said that you would see that as a mistake. Trump pulling the US out of the Paris Agreement will be a mistake. Why would it be a mistake? First of all, what I would say is the world needs to find ways to reduce emissions in a thoughtful, constructive way and a consistent approach. We need to do that while we're balancing the needs of people all around the world to have affordable energy. And so we call it the and equation. You got to do both. You can't focus on one at the exclusion of the other. That's going to require a global effort. There's no one country that's going to solve this problem. And so I do think an accord that brings together the world community to focus on this objective, which I believe is needed, is an important accord and one that countries should stay in. And, and I think the focus ought to be not necessarily on pulling in and out of the agreement, but finding a constructive way to advance the goals of the agreement without compromising economic growth, without compromising the growth and people's prosperity all around the world. And there is the opportunity to do that. I just don't think we've seen the policy manifest themselves to achieve it yet. There is also a chance that he doesn't just pull the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement, that he pulls the U.S. out of the U.N. Climate Treaty. Now, from a presidential perspective, they can't just rejoin a treaty. So say there's a new president who does care about climate change, who comes to power after Trump, they'll have to go to the Senate. And as you know, the Senate is really divided and a likelihood of getting a two thirds majority to join a climate treaty seems very far fetched right now. So there could be irreversible consequences of a Donald Trump election. Does that not worry you? I, we're very focused on what we as a company can do to contribute to this space. We're not a political entity. And so, I mean, I continue to stay focused on the long term. We serve global markets. We work all around the world. And that's what we're focused on doing is taking our capabilities and contributing. We're doing work not only in the U.S., but in Asia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, looking for opportunities to help with that. And so we'll continue to look for and pursue the opportunities where there's a need and a desire for us to contribute. So if there's more energy transition opportunities outside of the U.S., you already have a global company, you'll pursue those opportunities outside. Yeah. Let's look at the domestic front. We know under Trump, last time around, you saw lower corporate taxes. That means for corporations, higher profits. He has said he wants to cut taxes further, and that would mean even higher profits than the last time around. But he's also said he's going to roll back regulations domestically in the U.S. And... You've talked about how having that back and forth, that uncertainty is bad for business. But do you think the higher profits will make up for the regulatory uncertainty that is coming? Yeah, I'm not sure I would look at profitability and regulatory uncertainty as a, a plus and a minus or a balancing factor. I actually consider those two very separate things. I think there is a role for smart regulation, effective regulation. Uh, there's also a role to eliminate unproductive and inefficient regulation. And so that's a separate category. 
we're supportive of regulation for the industry. We think it's important, but we think it's important to have cost-effective, productive regulation that's consistent to allow business to give businesses a runway to implement that regulation. And I also believe that spurring economic growth is an important element of not only making the economy more successful, but then lifting people up and raising their standards of living. Can you give some examples of regulations that you think are ineffective and should go? I think, you know, what we're looking for is making sure that the intent of the regulation is clear and that the regulations are set in such a way that you achieve that intent at the lowest possible cost, that it's practical, that it can be implemented yeah. in the time frame that's, that's suggested. But no specific regulations not, come I to mind? I wouldn't get into any specific ones, no. So one thing that may happen is Donald Trump gets a trifecta. You know, he's won the presidency, he's won the Senate, Republicans have won the Senate. There is a likelihood that they get the House as well. And that gives them a mandate which could, in principle, allow them to take action such as repealing many of the things that are there under the Inflation Reduction Act. You brought it up, you said IRA is something that you're looking forward to, you're hoping that rules will be settled. There are tax credits for all kinds of climate solutions that you mentioned earlier. Do you think the repeal of some parts of the IRA will happen and do you welcome that? So let me maybe start with why we think the IRA makes sense. And if you look around the world and a lot of the climate policies that are being pursued, they pick winners and losers and they choose a technology and insist that that then gets pursued. Uh, the advantage of the IRA was it focused on outcomes, carbon intensity. Uh, our view was that's the right, if you're going to uh, mandate carbon rem emissions reductions, you ought to focus on the outcomes that you're looking for, put in place the regulations to uh, dictate those outcomes, and then let companies, individual businesses, the market figure out how best to meet those outcomes. And that's what the IRA has done. And so we're supportive of the IRA in that it approached emissions reductions in the right way. And what it allowed us to do as a company then is basically draw on all of our resources. So we are today investing to decarbonize the production of natural gas in the Permian. I can take that decarbonized natural gas, I can move it down a pipeline system that I operate, that I control the emissions on, I can bring it into my facility where I operate and control the emissions and convert that scope one and two uh, zero methane into hydrogen, capture the CO2 that's released in that conversion and store that so that I get a near zero hydrogen source. And I can do that and then qualify for the incentives that the IRA has. That's what we like about the IRA. And frankly, the IRA reflected what the administration felt like the people of America wanted them to do. The Trump, as you say, if he gets all three, the two houses in the White House, he has a mandate. He will then interpret what the people of America want. And our job is to respond to what work the people around the world want. We deliver on the needs. We use our capabilities to help address society's needs. We don't determine what those needs are. But the Inflation Reduction Act you're saying is technology neutral. Is it so? Because the tax credits are different for different technologies. Some tax credits have much more money than others. Uh, and yes, they are all uh, geared towards reducing emissions not just emissions intensity, they're geared towards reducing absolute emissions because they were geared towards the U.S. being able to hit its climate goals, which it currently isn't on track, but the IRA would have started to put it on track. So, so I, why I say it's, it's technology agnostic is it's focused on a carbon intensity for, say, hydrogen, a carbon intensity level. Right. It doesn't specify a technology to achieve that level. There may be an underlying assumption as to what technology you need in order to reach that. But from my perspective, and what we're advocating for is irrespective of what technology you use, if you can achieve that level, you should qualify for the credits. So that makes it technology agnostic. So let's take the example of hydrogen, because that's something that you have worked on mm -hmm. uh, quite consistently. So within the IRA, there's a tax credit called the 45V tax right. credit. Uh, currently, there's a lot of back and forth going around to figure out what the rules of that tax credit mm -hmm. would be. Most of the rules right now, if they're written, would prefer that that hydrogen is produced from renewable energy only. So you take solar and wind power, you put that into an electrolyzer, you split water, you create hydrogen. You are arguing that there should be another route allowed to be counted under those tax credits, which is to take natural gas, do carbon capture, so do steam methane reformation, convert that into hydrogen, capture the CO2, bury that. Do you think you'll succeed in getting the equivalency between what is known as green hydrogen coming from renewables and what is known as blue hydrogen that comes from carbon yeah, capture? Yeah, I think if you look at the legislation, it doesn't specify a Not color. Yet. Yes. 
Uh, it's the regulations that come from the legislation that will then specify mm -hmm. how that. But the legislation is very focused on carbon intensity levels. The regulations will then tell you how you qualify to meet those carbon intensity levels. And there are ways to do that today to meet high levels of or low levels of carbon intensity, high tiering within the legislation that doesn't require um, a color. And so all we're saying is, if I decarbonize my natural gas, I spend billions of dollars to reduce the emissions associated with production of natural gas, that as a company, I should get credit for that. And that, frankly, that's what you want to do. You want to incentivize our industry to invest the money to reduce the emissions associated with production of natural gas. That's what we're doing today. And what we're advocating for is that that reduction gets reflected when we're trying to qualify for a credit within the IRA. If that happens, which is what I think the intent of the legislation was, yeah. then that will justify the investments that we're making and the investment in the blue hydrogen. If it doesn't happen and they want to incentivize uh, green hydrogen and electrolyzers, we're not in that business. We won't make the investments. That's how it'll work. It's billed as the world's largest hydrogen plant. How much is it going to cost if you do get these tax credits? A lot. <laughs> no number? No number for you. <laughs> Billions. So here, here's one way to think about numbers, right? This year, in the first three quarters, Exxon has given shareholders $12 billion back in dividends, $14 billion as shareholder buyback, so you're just buying your own stock back. That's $26 billion in the first three quarters. If I calculate the cost of this hydrogen plant, it's a few billion dollars, two, three, four billion dollars. You could be doing that without the tax credits. Why don't you? Well, I have, I have a responsibility to shareholders, it's not my money. And so my job as a business, and this is, I think, one of the challenges that as you look at incentivizing all aspects of an economy, we all have different roles to play. I, I take shareholders' money, and my, I have a responsibility to generate a return on that shareholder money. And so it's critical for me to make sure that the investments that I'm making generate return for the shareholders. If I can't do that, if I have more money than I can productively invest and get a return, I have a responsibility to return that money to the shareholders so that they can invest in some other company to generate a return. So what I'm doing is balancing across the portfolio. I'm frankly building a business and have a strategy that allows me to be successful in, frankly, any scenario that you can forecast going forward. If you want to take the IA net zero, a very extreme decarbonization scenario, if you look at the businesses that we've established within the company, the core capabilities that we're building those businesses on, in that scenario, using the assumptions of the IA, I grow earnings and I grow cash flow. That's yeah. good for my uh, shareholders. I'm responsible for doing that. You can take the other extreme and say we don't make any progress with the transition. I'm using the same core capabilities and I can grow earnings and cash flow with my business. And so what you want, what you need, what the world needs is a transition that companies can make money in and generate returns on. Otherwise, you're not going to drive the investment that you need. Yeah. So I think you know what the world ought to be focused on is finding ways to profitably yeah manage the transition because we can't afford to, to, give, to yeah. give that away. Governments can't afford to pay that and subsidize it in perpetuity. We got to find a market that rewards for decarbonization. So take the example of carbon capture, which you talked about. You said you have 7 million tons per annum mm -hmm. of contracted carbon capture facility right now. Close to now, that, yeah. Now that is if you took all your emissions, such as scope one, two, and three, less than 2% of your total emissions. Right. Um, if you exclude scope three, it's still less than 10% of your total emissions. But Exxon has a reputation for getting results, has top-notch engineers, has the resources. You bought Denbury, a company that has carbon dioxide pipelines and mm -hmm. that supports a lot of your carbon capture business. Are you betting now that because of your spend on Denbury that carbon capture is going to be a viable business without subsidies? So I would tell you today, if you look at the drives to invest in the transition, there aren't any market forces or incentives to invest, which is why government policy is either mandating or subsidizing. And that's true across all the transitions. To go from the system that we have today to a less carbon intensive system is going to require money and it's going to be more expensive. And so the trick is to start down that path. You got to drive the cost of technology down. And so I would tell you, as we started this business, we've leveraged the IRA and the government incentives as a catalyst to get started while we work on the technologies to lower the cost. But ultimately, this has to transition away from government subsidies 
and into market-driven investments because ultimately that's what it's going to take to be successful if you want to roll this out across every economy around the world. But you've done that for other types of hydrocarbon technologies. You've done it for offshore drilling. You've done it for shale technology where you did not have subsidies. You did have to take real big risks with the technology. And the market and, rewarded us for and, that. And the market rewarded right. you because you executed, you made the technology viable. And now, if I look at your per barrel cost of oil over the past few years, they've been falling as a result of your investments in right. the technology. So I understand the theory completely that if you invest in a technology and you build projects at scale, you can drive down the cost. But you've done that so far really well for the hydrocarbon exploration and extraction technologies. But the set of investments when it comes to climate solutions is still very small. So well, it's large will pay relative you. to... Nobody will pay you for... And that's the sad fact today is nobody will pay us for emissions reductions. I could provide sustainable aviation fuel but no airline will sign a contract with me to provide it because it's more expensive than existing aviation fuel. That's the challenge of the transition is it's going to be more expensive and today the market won't bear that additional cost. And so as a company that has a responsibility to invest and generate a return, I got to find ways to do that without market forces that exist today, without the demand or the customer base that's willing to pay for it. That's the challenge in this space. And one thing where people could start to pay for these solutions and something that you have argued for for over a decade is to have a carbon price, a broad-based economy-wide carbon price. Now, if you look at the politics of a global broad-based carbon price, it doesn't exist. There is no global government mm -hmm. that's going to put a carbon price at a global level. Even at a national level, when many countries have tried to put a carbon price, look at your northern neighbor, Canada, the politics has become really toxic. So what you do have today is regional carbon pricing. You know, the European Union has been quite successful in certain sectors. It has a carbon price. In the U.S., you have California. You have some northeastern states that have a carbon price. We know that under a Trump presidency, there is going to be very unlikely that there'll be a, even conversations about a broad-based carbon price across the U.S. So what specific regulations will you ask for now that you can't get a broad-based carbon price in the U.S.? We've been advocating differently, recognizing the political challenges of a carbon price or a carbon tax. And I would also say, as we've worked through how that would function globally, it falls apart because of the reasons that you said that those prices change as you move around the nation. What we're now advocating for and what we've been talking about is starting first with uh, establishing a global carbon accounting system. You know, it's amazing to me today, if you think about what we're trying to do as a planet, as a world, that we want to reduce emissions, but today we have no mechanism for accounting for all those emissions. And so step number one is establish a global mechanism for accounting for carbon so that we know where all the carbon's being generated. As a chemistry person, you will know that CO2 gets created one time. We gotta account for that so we know where it's coming from. You get a carbon accounting system in place around the world. You can then start to calculate what the carbon intensity is for every aspect of your economy and for all the products that those economies are making. If you have a carbon intensity for the products that you're making, governments can now start to specify what the carbon intensity of the products sold in their markets have to be. Very similar to how today we sell diesel all around the world, but we have different desulfurization requirements for the diesel. So different specs for sulfur and diesel as you move around the world. And so there is an approach today that exists that we meet day in and day out to meet uh, specifications for the products that we sell globally. Doesn't require barriers or trade carbon border or border adjustments or anything like that. If you want to sell a product in that market, you have to meet that specification. We could establish carbon intensity specifications for products in any market. And if you want to sell a product in that market, you have to meet that carbon intensity specification. But the system you're describing already exists. No, so we are, sitting, we are sitting at a COP <clears throat> meeting, which is under the UN treaty. Under the UN treaty, every country has to report their annual greenhouse gas accounting to different greenhouse gases into the UN. So that exists at a country level. The second thing that exists, which was created in 2001, is the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is created by not-for-profits and by corporations to come up with a voluntary rules-based system 
that you report under. So when we talk about scope one, two, and three, direct and indirect emissions, that is under the greenhouse gas protocol. So what exactly are you trying to reinvent here? I'm very familiar with that. I'm not trying to reinvent anything. That's not a carbon accounting system because you account for the carbons several times. You have people double and triple counting carbon. That's not an accounting system. It has to add up to global emissions. You can't have multiple people counting the same molecules of CO2. You, you need to establish where that's coming from. And the, as you add up those emissions across different reporters, it should all add to the same total. You couldn't do that today with the GHG protocol. You can't do it with the GHG protocol, but the UN system does exactly that. I can't that. manage at a country level. You can't manage. You need, you need carbon accounting for a product level so that you can start to understand what the carbon intensity of the product is. That will then drive different manufacturers of that product to try to meet these carbon intensity specifications. That's exactly, think about desulfurization of diesel. There's no countrywide desulfurization number. It's done at a product level so manufacturers can meet those specifications. That does not exist today. So the greenhouse gas protocol, if you ignore scope three, does include scope one and two, which are direct emissions. They, If you only added scope one and two emissions- right. I will guarantee other... you that everyone's calculating those things differently. There's not a consistent standard as you move around the world, around the countries, or even between businesses. That's the challenge. That's the difference between sitting at a table like this and talking about it and running a business like I have to actually deliver on those things. There is not a consistent approach. That's what we're advocating for. So one thing that Exxon does really well is be able to lobby for outcomes you want that would help support many of the goals that you've stated. Mm -hmm. Are you lobbying for new rules Absolutely. on carbon accounting? What are they? Well, that's what we're asking. ExxonMobil can't create a global system, but we are talking to governments around the world to suggest that they form a basis to start this work, to establish a system for accounting for carbon around the world, right. establish protocols for how you calculate carbon intensity for different products, and then each government has the opportunity to set carbon intensity specifications. We are working to try to see that idea and then to get governments around the world to start driving that. So one place that might have been happening, and tell me if that's true, is when the SEC in the U.S. was working towards reporting rules on scope one and two emissions for corporations. Were you engaged in those conversations when they asked for a request for comment? Did you send in a request for comment asking for what rules you'd yeah, like? Yeah, we did. And I'd say this, the SEC is not the body for establishing carbon accounting system across. It's There's a it's not a gap accounting system. It needs to it needs to be like a gap accounting system where you have consistent approach. But as you know, CO2 is, there's a science that sits behind it. Yes. So the SEC is not the body to do that. You need Which a regulatory body. body. Well, that's, that's what we've got to establish. This is a brand new approach that we're trying to establish, consistent with what we've done in other areas of our products. But this is one that has to be established today. There's a transportation organization that does that for motor fuels today. That could be one area. But this is an opportunity to do it across in entire economy. After the break, more of my conversation with Exxon CEO Darren Woods. By the way, if you've been enjoying this episode, please take a moment to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps other listeners find the show. So let's come to some of the other uh, climate solutions that you talked about. You have said in the past that as ExxonMobil, the thing you want to invest in, in climate solution space is molecules, not electrons. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard that and I knew that I was going to talk to you, I thought on this table, there's a chemical engineer and that's me. And I'm arguing for more renewables and there's an electrical engineer mm -hmm. and that's you and you're arguing for molecules, not mm -hmm. electrons. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, I, I run a business that's <laughs> in the molecule business. That's what happened. <laughs> I think, you know, what we when I first got into this job, a lot of pressure to move into wind and solar. And we looked at that. I mean, we recognized the need for the world to decarbonize and whether or not we could contribute something in that space. Yeah. But if you look at what our core capabilities are, where we have developed competitive advantage, it's not in the electron business. Right. People think that we're in the energy business because we supply fuel for energy, but we provide fuel for mobility for cars. It doesn't put us in the transportation business or as an automaker. So we're focused on what do we do today? Today we explore for and produce and then 
manage and transform hydrogen and carbon molecules to a variety of products that, that meet the critical needs of society. That's yep. what we do. It goes far beyond combustible products. That's where our strengths are. And so as we looked at those capabilities, how can we apply that then to this challenge of reducing emissions? And the solutions we've come up with is our low carbon solutions business. Right. And one of those solutions is biofuels uh, mm -hmm. in your portfolio. And your push on biofuels has been quite interesting. You spent roughly $350 million trying to convert algae into biofuels. My colleagues uh, worked on a story where they found that you also spent $60 million on just TV advertising, telling the world that you're working on it. But now you've wound that down and you're not investing in it because you don't see that it's working out as a climate solution. So what are the lessons from the failure of algae for biofuels that you will apply to future climate solutions? Well, I think, you know, the challenge here is when you're trying to develop breakthrough technologies, you never know whether or not that's going to be successful. And I think that's the case for algae was we recognized when we were pursuing that, that we had to make some significant breakthroughs in the productivity, uh, the oil productivity of algae if we were going to be successful. And we worked on that for several years to try to make those advances, but it became very clear as we were working our way and actually achieving some of the milestones that we were not going to get to the level of productivity that would allow us to effectively scale that technology to meet this much broader demand out there. And so we had to come to the conclusion that while uh, this held promise, it wasn't going to solve the problem, which then had us pivot to other technology areas. We're now working on a direct air capture technology. That is a huge uh, hill to climb. There's a huge, a lot of breakthroughs that we need there. So we have built a prototype. We're working hard on that. We talk about the work that we're doing in direct air capture. I can't promise you today that we will be successful in it. But what I can promise you is we're committed to trying to make it successful. And I think that's what you actually want is you want companies that have capabilities around the world to be looking for ways that they can innovate and drive advancements in technologies to solve this problem. Not all of them are going to be successful, but the more companies you have doing that, leveraging their core capabilities, the better chance we have as a planet of finding a solution. And so that's what we're working on. And we're continuing to look for others. We've got other technologies that we're advancing to try to um, uh, reduce emissions, but they're in the very early stages. They require technical breakthroughs. Yeah. We'll work in those. We'll talk about them as we go forward, and hopefully we'll find some that are successful, but I can't guarantee it. But $60 million on TV advertising, surely one of the lessons might be not to advertise a solution before it's working? Well, I think it's important for people to know what we're trying. If you want to limit only talking about the things that are going to absolutely work, it'll be an awful quiet world out there. <laughs> and I think, you know, trying to make sure that uh, everyone recognizes the need for a diversified set of solutions and that you've got many companies around the world working hard to try to find those solutions, it's important. I would argue what we haven't done enough is to help people understand how we are trying to contribute in this space. And so almost the opposite, I would suggest we need to do more to help people understand the work that we're doing to be a meaningful contributor in this space. So if you look at the wider business, you're here at a COP, you know that one of the agenda items that was agreed on at COP28, which was being argued on in day one over here, is how does the world transition away from fossil fuels? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's happened among the oil majors, where Exxon has really pulled ahead of all your peers, Shell, Chevron, BP, is that Exxon has really increased its production of oil over the past few years. And that's proven to be a hugely profitable strategy with two things. One, prices going up, but also your cost of per barrel of oil going down. And that's made uh, Shell and Chevron envious of what Exxon is doing. There's also a risk though. Say the energy transition does speed up at some point, does it not worry you? You might have stranded assets? No, because I'd tell you, if you look at oil production around the world, the first point to make is it's a depletion resource, it's a depleting resource. So every barrel you produce is a barrel you don't have. If you look at the supply of oil today in the market with the amount of unconventional oil that's come on out of the U.S., that mix has changed pretty dramatically. Unconventional oil depletes at a much faster rate. Yep. And so with zero investment going into the industry to produce more oil, that depletion rate is about 15% per year. And that is an extremely steep decline rate. And so the industry has to invest significant amount of money just to hold production flat. And so as you look at the world, the challenge is maintaining enough production to meet the demand in the near and the medium term. 
And because that depletion curve will catch up to you very quickly, the energy system is huge. The transition is going to take time. And if we make advances in other technologies, if the right kind of policies come into place to yeah. incentivize the transition and move there faster, depletion will, will take care of the resources that are out there today being produced. And investment should shift then from that portfolio to a portfolio of, of the new energy sources, the new transition. That's, that's what our strategy does. Because we're using the same core capabilities. I can put my reservoir engineers on to storing CO2, uh, looking for uh, brine water with lithium in it, or for exploring for oil. Right. And whichever one of those businesses are more successful and grows faster, I shift the resources there. Same with my projects organization. I have that opportunity, that flexibility, so that I can thrive as a business well into the future, irrespective of the scenario that we see. Earlier you were talking about investors when we talked about how much money you've given back to investors this year, $12 billion in dividends, $14 billion in share buybacks. You said that investors are smart people. They can do what they want with that money, right? And you've been a close watcher of investors even before you became CEO. You were in the investor relations role at some points in, in your career mm -hmm. during Exxon. Now, it seems to me that investors are looking at companies like Exxon, not just you, but the oil majors in general, and they want as much of the profit as possible extracted, but they also want you to be very disciplined in what types of new oil and gas projects you invest in. Is that a right assessment? What investors want is to make sure that you're spending that money wisely and you're going to yep. generate a return. And so yes. the way we look at it, disciplined investment means investing only in the projects where you have an advantage mm -hmm. that will be resilient to the down cycles because these capital intensive commodities businesses have price cycles that we have a high price and you move into low price. That is a, that's a constant in this business. You're always moving through these cycles. And so the investments that we make have to be robust to the down cycles. They have to be advantage versus the rest of industry. They have to be capital efficient. That's what disciplined yep. investing is. And it shows up in your capital expenditures. Say you compare yourself during the 2010s to the 2020s, you're spending a lot less on your capital expenditure, even as your oil production is higher than it was back then. Would you say one of the ways in which investors are thinking about this is that they want not just Exxon, but oil companies in general to run in a harvest mode where they draw down the profits and the investors then invest in the companies they think are building the climate solutions. And Exxon does the job of a good corporation of producing the profits that it needs, but maybe it shrinks eventually because the world doesn't need as much fossil fuel. Well, I think the facts are counter to that, though. Mm. The world needs more fossil fuels. If you look at the demand today, as I mentioned at the beginning, demand for oil today is at record levels. It'll grow going into next year. And so that's, I think, the thing you have to, you know, we as a very large company represent probably about 3% of the world's oil and gas supply. And so as a company, yeah. we're not going to dictate how much oil and gas gets used in the world. In fact, there's no single company that's going to dictate that. Uh, what dictates the, the amount of oil that gets used in the world is, one, what is the available alternatives that meet the collection of needs, one of them being affordability, one of them being reliability, one of them being availability. you got to have an energy supply that does that. depends on how quickly economies are growing. It depends on how quickly people's prosperity are living. So those are the things that are going to drive demand. And then the challenge for our industry is to meet that demand and to meet those different criteria. And as we continue to work for ways to decarbonize and meet those needs with lower emissions, that's the challenge that we face. But you can't stop meeting those needs to reduce emissions because now you basically create more and more human hardship. This is the challenge that I started this conversation with is you've got to find a way to do both. But if there are no ideologies and there are just incentives, we talked through how the incentive to reduce emissions will come from carbon pricing because that will allow people to make choices for lower carbon products at a, at a cost that is the right cost for those products versus the cost that society bears from climate change. If carbon pricing is not going to happen, as we've talked about the political infeasibility of it, are you supportive of just direct regulation to reduce emissions? Because something has to cause well, that's those regulations I'm, that's to That's what fall. I'm suggesting. When I talk about a carbon, carbon accounting system, global carbon accounting system, and then, a, and then a mechanism for calculating carbon intensity at a product level, and then a regulation that 
sets the specification for carbon intensity for that market so that right. every country can set the carbon intensity specifications for the products sold in that market. That gets rid of the need for these very inefficient and cumbersome carbon border adjustments. Right. So yeah, that's what we're talking about. Regulation, as I said at the beginning, is there's a need for smart, efficient, thoughtful regulation. We think this is an area we could do that in, the world could do that in. So one place where regulations have had an impact to some extent is methane. Uh, you've set a target to reduce methane emissions by 80% by 2030, and you say you are on track. Mm -hmm. There's a reduction of 60% mm -hmm. uh, as of last year. But why not go further? Because your colleagues at the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative have a zero methane emissions by 2030 target. That's what we're doing. We're, we're part of that commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to go beyond the 80% that you've set already? So we, it's a near zero methane. So what's basically possible is, is what the industry is committing to. And we're part of that commitment. And we're, that's what we're working our way to. Okay. So that, because that right now, the official target is 80% reduction by we 2030. We said by 2030. Yeah. Yes. But so we'll when you want to get near, to near we'll zero. We'll be at near zero when we get, to, so it's an 80% reduction that gets us down to near zero. Now, the second elephant in the room that I wanted to bring up, but we got sidetracked into a lot of other discussion, is one about trust. And it is worth acknowledging here, a lot of people in this room will be familiar with Exxon's history around sowing doubt on climate science to slow down climate action. At one point, Exxon employed some of the world's best climate scientists. They predicted very accurately what would happen if you keep burning fossil fuels and we are living with those consequences today. You've said multiple times Exxon is a different company today. But given Exxon's history, why should people trust you now? Yeah, well, I think what you've described, there's, you, you can debate, I think, the facts around that. I think we had two scientists working 30 or 40 years ago. These are things that happened 30 or 40 years ago. I think what people ought to focus on, what have we been doing? Mm -hmm. What are we committing to do and what are we demonstrating that we're doing? And as I come back to, if you look at the things that we're doing today, we're investing more than any other company across a broader array of solution sets to try to help economies decarbonize. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're, we can be expected to do or what should be expected of us. And I think we're, we're working hard to deliver on that. But at the end of the day, you got to have supportive policy in lieu of a market, but ultimately you got to have market forces. But when we talk about those efforts, which you say were 30, 40 years ago, now you were at the company at the time, you joined in 1992. Mm -hmm. Many of these efforts were done in the 90s and the 2000s. I know you weren't in a role which made the decisions whether these efforts go forward or not, but you are in charge of the entire company today. Mm -hmm. And the questions I'm asking you are questions that your predecessors took actions on and now you're answering those questions. 20 years from now, your successors will be answering questions about the actions you take today. Mm -hmm. So that will be a time when climate impacts will be worse. And I'm saying will because that's a scientific certainty, as Exxon scientists have predicted. So what are you doing now to protect your legacy at Exxon? We're trying to solve the problem is leveraging the capabilities that we have as a company. That's what we've been talking about this whole podcast. I mean, the reality is there's no one company out there doing more than we're doing. If you look at the amount of money that we're investing on an annual basis, the commitments we make on an average annual basis, it's a third of what the U.S. EPA is spending. That's one company doing that. So again, I, I'm not claiming that we're going to solve the problem. What I'm claiming is we're going to use our capabilities to contribute to solving that problem. I think that's all that we can ask of ourselves as a company, and that's what we're doing. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Zero. And now for the sound of the week. That's the sound of the heaters keeping us warm in the Baku Stadium here at COP29. If you liked this episode, please take a moment to rate or review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Share this episode with a friend or with someone who has had a crude oil bath at a spa. You can get in touch at zeropod at bloomberg.net. Zero's producer is Maithili Rao. Bloomberg's head of podcast is Sage Bauman, and head of talk is Brendan Newnham. Our theme music is composed by Wonderly. Special thanks to Kevin Crowley, Jen DeLouis, Shawan Wagner, Aaron Rutkoff, Jessica Beck, and Ethan Steinberg. Thanks also to the Atlantic Council, the International Chamber of Commerce, and Uwe Sabirowski. 
I am Akshat Rati. Back soon.